We've got to get to this first. Because we can't go in with wrong attitudes. I'm not even going to play the video, Kylie. It's not time, it's not, not time for that. We can't come into God's presence wrong. And that's what we do. Do you want to go have a seat? Do you want to play softly behind me for a minute? It's cool. We cannot come into God's presence. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, you can see we've got the pray like this. That's our new series that we're starting. God has been, he, is, he, he has been shaking me. He has been slapping me. He has been almost punching me in the face. God's not like that. God, yeah, He is. To me, He is. Because He's a holy and He's a righteous God. And if we come into His presence unworthily, unworthily then we've got a problem. See, the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't say teach us how to have more praise and worship. They didn't say teach us how to, how to earn extra money. They didn't say teach us in the rituals of our forefathers. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. When is the last time you looked at the Lord and said, Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me on how I need to come into your presence. Teach me. When is the last time you looked at the Lord and said that? When is the last time we came humbly before Him? See, this is something that, that we lose sight of a lot. We read over that and we say, oh yeah, yeah. And, 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 and if, I, if I would begin to say it, you would be able to quote it. I'm sure many in here would be able to quote it if I would say what Jesus said when the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Does anybody know what He said? Okay, so go ahead and say it. I, I see a couple of you doing it right now. The Lord's Prayer. Can you recite it? Go ahead and say it. Now that last part is not in some translations because that is an add-on after the, after the earliest manuscripts. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. So that you're not going to find that in all translations. But, but when we said with, that is what Jesus said. Now is that meant to be repeated verbatim every time we pray? <coughs> How do you pray? Well see now that's, that is kind of a personal thing. But if, if anybody wants to share you feel free. How is it that you pray? Terry, go ahead. I just pray and I talk to God. Okay. I just talk to him about what's going on. And right. What I need. Right. So you, so you don't use a ritual. You don't use a no, form. Just, every day is a different day. Every day is a different day. Every day is a new day, right? Right. And it's the only day he has. And it's the only day I love her joy and enthusiasm. I'm going to tell you right now. Well, she, I Right. What can I do this day, Lord? Right. How do I serve you this day? Right. Not tomorrow or next week, but just this day. Because I don't know if I'll wake up tomorrow morning because I'm in that terrible, what they call that, that the section of getting old. <laughs> and you don't know if you've got well, the next day. But the thing is, you don't have to be in that section of getting old. No. Because you're not old. You can drop now. See, so so I, I love, like I said, I love her enthusiasm. I, does anybody else want to share? See, the Lord's Prayer it, it, it became to be called that. I don't know why, but the, the, we came to call this the Lord's Prayer, and that's not really the Lord's Prayer. The disciples came to him and said, "Teach us how to pray." Why? Because they saw what Jesus was doing. They saw the fact that he went and he spent time with the Father daily. 
almost in that culture, it's probably three times a day. How many pray three times a day? Yeah, Sister Terry, I love that. Yeah, listen, it's a, it, it needs to be an open conversation, right? It's not a it's not a ritual, but there are ways, there are things that we need to learn from what they call the Lord's Prayer, and we need to learn how to pray like this. There are things that we've got to understand, and we need to be looking at Him saying, Lord, teach us to pray. We need to say that ourselves. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to come, how to approach God's throne. I know that Hebrews says, boldly come into His presence. I know what it says, we can now boldly come into the presence of God, but there are, there is a way that we need to do that. We, that there is a proper way to do that. How many know in the Old Testament that if they didn't enter into the holy place, the most holy place, the right way, they died. That's why they wore bells around the bottom of their uh, around the bottom of their uh, garments, so that way the people on the outside, the priests on the outside, could listen and make sure he did, you know, make sure he was still good and he was still moving around. If he wasn't moving around, that means he entered wrong, and they were on a, the the whole country was in a world of trouble. Okay, so so you understand that. So so I mean, the way, when you look at this, and, and you know. Have you ever gotten lost and confused? You know what, Kylie? Go ahead and play the video. I got a five-minute video we're gonna play, and and maybe to lighten the mood a little bit. God's still here, okay? We can laugh and still be in God's presence, right? So we've got a video, and it's it's really interesting. Go ahead and play it. I'm not gonna say any more about it. It's really praise and worship for the Jehovah's Witness Church. See songs like. Now turn it up. Let me in. Can you believe it? I love worship by the Church of Christ. In case you don't know the Church of Christ, don't have to be there with this. You do laugh. Go ahead. They laugh. They love that joke. Because it's funny. I think the way we pray is, it, prayer, is a, prayer is a powerful thing, but I think it's when you grow up in church, it's just you hear prayers all the time in different styles and stuff. And little quirks that people have when they pray. I don't know. Little phrases that I don't understand to this day. But we use the phrases, but we, we, that's just what we heard growing up. We think that's just the right thing to say when we pray. You know, like hedge of protection. You ever hear that? You hear that a lot. Hedge of protection. Dude, we're going to pray a hedge of protection around you, buddy. That's right. A hedge. <laughs> Around you and your whole family. Go ahead, John. I don't mean to complain. Is that the best you can do? How about a fix cement wall? Put some razor wire on top of that bad boy. There's a big set of clippers get right through that thing. I'm sure the devil's got a set of those. I mean, you think a hedge is going to scare the devil away? And like, what is this greenery? <laughs> I can't get through that. <laughs> Move that bush. <laughs> My greatest weakness is landscaping. How do they know? <laughs> Some people, like, when they pray, they get nervous and they say just too much. You know, you pray in small group, like, like, oh, Jeff, oh, Jeff, oh, Jeff, oh, Jeff, oh, Jeff, 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 Jeff for Jeff, Jeff for Jeff, Jeff for Jeff, Jeff for Jeff, Jeff and Jeff for Jeff, Jeff for Jeff, and you're like, just finish the prayer. You're just not ready for this. Start stacking chairs. Come back next week and cry again. My dad does this when he prays. He uses father way too much when he prays. Father, you gotta be your father, and spirit of father, father, you are father, you gotta be your father, father, just, just, father, father, just. Just, just, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you don't talk to your friends like that. Ed, Ed, come over, Ed, 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 you are Ed, 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 Ed,
when they pray for food. That's the funniest. <laughs> when we pray for food, we don't know why we say, you ever heard this one? Lord, bless this food and the hands that prepared it. <laughs> the hands that prepared it. <laughs> why not the whole body? <laughs> food and ask God to make up for our bad choices when we eat. That's funny. <laughs> Lord, bless this food to the nourishment of our bodies. Lord, bless this bag of Cheetos. <laughs> and this Jumbo Dr. Pepper, Lord. Somehow make this nourish us in some way. I don't know how you're going to do it, Father, but we just trust in you now. <laughs> Father, change the molecular structure of this food. This complete trash we're about to shove in our gummy. Change the Cheeto into a carrot stick on the way down. Steer the low collar bring it down on me now. Pray to protection around my pancreas, Lord. The worst prayers, they got to be the prayers that parents pray with their kids. No wonder they don't want to go to bed at night. My parents used to pray this with me in the dark when I was a kid. Now I may be down to sleep. I may lull myself. If I should die. <laughs> Before I wake, I pay the rule. Mind you. Sweet I can't hear a candy thing. <laughs> okay, you can stop it. <laughs> we're not, we're, we're not, we're, please understand, we're not, we're not saying, you know, the, the praying like that is, is bad, but, but have you ever gotten into God's prayer? Have you ever listened to some of the things we say when we pray? I mean, you know, the, the, that, that prayer before bedtime, think about it. How many know that prayer? How many have said that prayer? I mean, you know, or, or, or you know, bless, you know, the hands that prepare. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't really think about it until uh, until I saw that. I was like, wow, yeah, that's um, yeah, I, I prayed all those things. Anybody else? Every one of those things I prayed. What is a hedge? I don't know. Why are we playing just a hedge? But see, this is this is what happens. We get confused. When it comes to God's to coming into God's presence, we get confused when it comes to prayer. How many have ever been in God's presence and you don't know what to say? Oh, I'm the only one. Okay, I got it. <laughs> See, but, but, but that's that's what we want to talk about now. We want to learn how to not not learn how to, the the not the, there's not a, a magic pattern that's going to get you what you need. This is but there is a pattern that we need to follow. And I don't know that you've ever looked at the Lord at what we call the Lord's Prayer like this before. And so let's do that today. We're gonna we're gonna look at this today, and we're gonna talk about how Jesus wants us to pray in order to come into God's presence the right way. This is not something that He meant to be repeated all the time as we pray. This is not a substitute for our prayer. And sometimes some of those things that you just heard, we just say those things out of out of repetition, out of, out of ritual, don't we? No, again, I'm, I'm the only one that ever done, that's ever done that. Okay, it's going to be a tough room this morning. You're going to have to pray for me because it's a tough room this morning. Uh, so we, when we look at this, and we need to understand exactly what it is and how Jesus wants, to, wants us to come into God's presence. So let's look at... Oh, praise God. 
I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna struggle with the with the computer this morning. So with that, Kylie, can you fix that? Get, can you shrink it down? The 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 text. I should have checked that before. I don't know why it does that when it when it when it comes over. I don't know why it does that. Uh, but who can say who can say the first line? Who can repeat the first line for me? Okay, stop right there. Our Father who art in heaven. You're going to have to change all the slides if it's like that. Our Father who art in heaven. So what does that mean? Anybody know? What is Jesus wanting us to do as we say, Our Father who art in heaven? What is it Jesus wants us to do? What is it He's wanting us to say? Exactly. So we need it. it I call them hoopa <laughs> prayers. Yes. Because they just puff up. You don't talk to people that way. Exactly. Exactly. It's like he said, you know, that have you ever said, have you ever heard somebody who just repeats Father or Father or Jesus or Jesus all over and just, just repeats and repeats it over and over and over, right? I bet. I've done it. I've done it because I don't know what else to say. If I were talking to Jeff, I wouldn't say Jeff, 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 Jeff. Yeah, see what I said? Exactly. <laughs> wouldn't talk to him long. So it, 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 this is what this is. He's a, Jesus is instructing us on how we should approach God. God is holy. God is righteous. God is powerful, all powerful. God is almighty, all powerful. And what Jesus is doing is he's using our Father. Now, when you see that term Father, is that a term of, of you know, like you would greet the President of the United States? Hey, what's up, Joe? We wouldn't, we wouldn't, but, but this is, see, what Jesus is teaching here is that there is an intimate relationship that, that God wants us to have. And when you look at this, it says our Father, and it sounds like it's proper, right? It sounds like it's proper. It sounds like, you know, it, 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 it's, uh, uh, you know, one of, those, one of those serious terms, but what, it, it, and that's the way it translated from Greek. When you look at it in Aramaic, which is what Jesus spoke, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. And when you look at the translation from Aramaic, that is a very intimate term. If my children come up to me and say, Father, I have done something to irritate them. Now, Father, right? I have done something to irritate them. What do my kids normally call me? They call me Daddy. It's a term of endearment. What Jesus was saying is, we don't need to come into God's presence. God, God wants us, thank you Kylie, we need, God wants us to come into His presence and understand that we're coming in as a parent-child relationship. He is the parent. He is, the, he is God Almighty. He is the ultimate parent, right? And Jesus modeled that for His disciples all the time. When he, you think about the Garden of Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out, "Abba, Father," which is a very intimate term, and, and the disciples heard this every time he prayed, "Abba, Father." He was coming in, and this is not to take away from the respect of who God is, because God is Creator; He is the one who created all of this. But Jesus is teaching us that we need to build this intimacy with God the Father. We need to build this intimacy with Him. And how do you do that? You begin by praying. Just coming to Him first. Recognizing Him. Our Father in Heaven. You're recognizing His greatness. You're recognizing His, His majesty. But at the same time, you're saying, I am a child. I am your child. Are we all not called children of God? Those who know Jesus Christ are called children of God. And so we're coming into His presence 
with this parent-child relationship. Anybody ever been spanked by God? I guess I'm the only one that's been spanked by God too. <laughs> Told you, he's been, he's been working with me this day. He's been working with me for a while. Maybe you got it all under control. Maybe you don't need this. But I, 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 th- I think we all need to understand that God is our Heavenly Father. We, it's not just a term we throw out there. He wants to be in relationship with us. So we need to be looking to Him and saying, Lord, teach us how to have an intimate relationship with the Father. Yes. That's first that we see there. Our Father in Heaven. Our Father in Heaven. And when you then look down and you go down to the next part, it says, Your name be honored as holy. With your name be honored or hallowed be Thy name. Right? Do you know what that means? Or again, or is this just something you repeat? And you read over and you think, I don't know what that means, but I'm not going to look it up. I'm just going to read past it. I'm sure it means something great. <laughs> right? That's, that's how we think. See, your name be honored. This is in the CSB version. It says, your name be honored as holy. When is the last time you honored God's name as holy? Because His name is holy. You hear it on TV all the time. They use it as a byword. They use it as a cuss word. Your name be holy. Your your name be honored as holy. See, we we have the influences of the world and we lose respect for the name of the Father, for the name of God. We lose respect. And it creeps into the church. We decrease into the church and, 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 and we allow that to we allow that to affect our image, our view of God. Because as Carl said, a lot of times, even in church world, even in the church world, what happens is we view God as a genie in a bottle. And we think that if we go to him and we we repeat this prayer, it's like rub it on the bottle and he's gonna come out and he's gonna bless us with whatever whatever we want. That's what we think. In the church. I'm not talking about out there. You go out there and you ask them, they can repeat this prayer too. Because this is one of the most, most, famous, most famous pieces of Scripture there is. But Jesus is what He's doing here. Your name be honored as holy. Hallowed be thy name. What Jesus is doing here is He is fixing our mistaken view of God. He is reminding us that God is not a genie in the bottle. He is not some Santa Claus. He is not the big guy. He is not the man upstairs or whatever whatever term you've heard mentioned. He is not that. He is God. He is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. The same God that required holiness in the Old Testament is the same God today. The same God that required holiness in the New Testament is the same God today. He is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And what Jesus is doing here is He is fixing our broken view of who God is. Do you view Him as a genie in the bottle? Someone that's just there to grant every request you make. See, our chief concern in prayer is that God would be honored and glorified. My God, how great You are. How great, how great You are. See, you don't have to be singing. You can just say that. Because that's the whole thing. The greatest thing is, and the greatest concern we have is that He be honored and glorified. The priests of the tabernacle and the temple, they wouldn't just openly speak His name in the Old Testament. Yeah, we walk around and say, oh God, oh my God. OMG, we've, we've, we've abbreviated now. OMG. Or we could get really vulgar and we, you know, we could say what some, what, what some of the other people say. They throw all kinds of interesting words in there. But you, you understand, in the Old Testament, they wouldn't just openly speak His name because they revere His name as holy. They wouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. They revered His name as very holy. 
See, in the, when, when they were when they were when the scribes were 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 writing down the scriptures, when the scribes were there and they were writing down the scriptures, maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't know this. But when they were writing the when they were writing this down, when they were writing the scriptures out, when you know somebody would be up there reading and, and the scribes would be there writing, and every time they came across the name of Yahweh, every time they came across the Lord's name, they would put their pen, they would actually throw their pen out. Then they would go through a ritual of cleansing before they moved on. That is how much they revered the name of God. They wouldn't even write His name out without performing a, a cleansing ritual. How is, it you, how is it you view God today? Do you view Him like the genie in the bottle or do you view Him as holy and righteous. See, that's what Jesus is wanting us to do here. He's wanting us to fix our view of God. See, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, Peter tells us this, But as the one who called you is holy, as the one who called you is holy, who called you? Who called you? God. As, so, so let's put that in there. But as the one who, call, who called you, which is God, is holy, you are holy, you are to be holy in all your conduct. Verse 16 says, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Are you holy today? Or are you a holy mess today? I've been a holy mess for, for, for a while. <laughs> See, you know what Peter's doing there? Peter's quoting Scripture. Peter is quoting something. In verse 16, he is, he is quoting out of something. He is quoting from the book of Leviticus. So for anyone to say God doesn't require holiness now is wrong because you're saying the Scripture's wrong. You're saying He's not the same God in the Old Testament because what Peter did is he brought from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So God requires us to be holy. How can we be holy? There's only one way to be holy and that is to ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us, and to make us holy as God is holy. Again, he is fixing our view of God. Be holy as I am holy. See, again, I want to ask the question, what's your view of God today? How do you view God? Do you realize that He is holy? Do you really realize that He is holy in your life? Do you realize that, 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 that coming into His presence requires us to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus? It doesn't matter if you sinned at all. You're still a human being. You still have pride. You still have egos. You still have all of these things that you've got to get cleansed and placed under the subjection of Jesus Christ before you can come into God's presence. Just because we're living in a time of grace and mercy does not mean we, do, we, we need to put this the fact that He is holding, we are to be holy to the side. Yeah, this is hard, isn't it? This is hard to hear. See, you know, again, a lot of times we just read through the Lord's Prayer and think, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I love how Jesus said that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, it's, beautiful. it's written like poetry. It's so beautiful. But there is there's a purpose behind it. There is a reason Jesus said it. See, we must look to Jesus and we must say, Lord, teach us how to reveal God's name as holy. The GD is one of the things I can't stand. The GD word. Because God never damns anything. Our actions are what damn us. God never damns anything. So it really bothers me when I hear that. But really, we should, we, we, we should get offended any time takes the name of Jesus in vain. Any time anyone says, oh my God. And they're not praying. We should take that as offensive. Do you take all those things as offensive? Mm. Lord, teach us to reveal the Father as holy. So we move on to the next part of the prayer. And the next part of the prayer is, Your kingdom come, Your will be done. Right? Your kingdom come, Your will be done. 
You know what you, you know what we're doing there when we say that when we when, when Jesus Jesus is again wanting us to fix our view of everything, and He is wanting us to understand that we need to be under the subjection of God. How many like for how many like for someone to come up to you and tell you what to do? You're not my boss, right? How many have ever heard that? You're not my boss. How many have ever said that? You don't own me. You don't rule me. I'm not. You're not my boss. I, I don't have to listen to you, right? That's that prideful spirit that I just that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. That's that prideful spirit. We need to take that prideful spirit and crucify that thing on the cross of Jesus. We need to take that thing and put that thing on the cross because that thing does not belong in God's presence. What was Satan cast out of heaven for? Pride. And so if you are going into God's presence with that prideful spirit, it's like you're Lucifer going into God's presence when he tried to get, when he did get one third of the angels to rebel. That is what you're doing. We cannot come into God's presence with our pride in place. Our ego. We need to lay all that at the cross of Jesus and we need to say, I am only human, Father. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't understand your ways. Your ways are higher than my ways. I don't understand it. But I want your will to be done in my life. I want your will to be done in my life. It's His plans that matter, not ours. It's His thoughts that matter, not ours. And as a matter of fact, we had this discussion at the dinner table. And, uh, and, and, and one of the kids said, well, the, well, our opinions do matter. When it comes to God, our opinions do not matter. Because He is holy, He is righteous, and He is above us. He stands outside of time. He stands outside of space and time as we learn. He stands outside of it all. So I would much rather come under someone who sees everything coming, who knows exactly what's going to take place before it takes place, who knows what could have taken place, who knows what will take place, and who knows what I'm going to choose to make take place. I would much rather come under His subjection and say, Your will be done, not mine. Your will. That's what Jesus did, right? Do you think Jesus wanted to be crucified? How many in here will think that Jesus wanted to be crucified? He knew what was coming. How many think Jesus wanted to take those stripes? To have that crown shoved in His head? To have that spear shoved up in His side? To be nailed to a cross. How many think Jesus wanted to do that? It's obviously He didn't because we see it in Scripture. Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. This cup of wrath is what He was talking about. Let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, Your will be done, not mine. That is that... Jesus removing every sense of that human pride. Removing that human pride. Because He was 100% God, 100% man. Amen? And he had, he had the same struggle we do with pride. We've got to say, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I submit everything to You. I give it to You. I mean, I like giving up in anything. I, 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 it's interesting. What what do people do? You're, you're fighting. Well, think about the. Uh, I just watched something on uh, uh, Desert Storm. Everybody remember Desert Storm? Mind they, they say it's mind control stuff. But anyway, they, they, they psychological. It was a psychological warfare. Because remember, the the the, the fourth. The, I didn't realize this. Iraq had the fourth largest army in the world. Fourth largest. Everybody know that? Well, he paid you. Brother Carl probably did. <laughs> but when they, they were showing pictures, because remember, there was hardly anything done. It was a four day war. They surrendered. The fourth largest, the fourth largest, largest military in the world, they surrendered. And what, what did they do when they surrendered? They were waving what? What do we do when we surrender? We wave what color, what color flag? 
White flag. Okay, so they had white flags. And what, what else were they doing? The majority of them were doing what? Hands up. That's a set, that, that is a universal sign of I surrender. That's a universal sign of I surrender. I surrender. I've got nothing in my hand. I surrender. This is what Jesus is wanting us to do. We must surrender to who God is. Because again, in Isaiah 55 verse 9, it says, For heaven, for as heaven is higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Does that sound like somebody we need to submit to? Our ways don't matter. Our thoughts don't matter. Why? Because God tells us His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and His ways are higher than our ways. We will never fully understand who God is and what He's doing in this world. We, Our finite minds cannot understand it. So that's why we need to submit to Him. And that is what Jesus is saying when He says, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now what, 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 what's the next part? Anybody know the next part? So you got to see it rolling around some head in some people's head. No, I hope you all it's fine. So you have to understand as well that with the disciples, the disciples saw a ritual. There was a ritual that was performed by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. There was a ritual that was performed. And so not only were they possibly praying like that, they were also praying in this ritualistic form and they saw that Jesus didn't do that. And so they, they, and they know that Jesus talked to God. There's something about those people you know. Who are they going to call when they're sick? Who are they, when you're working around somebody, when you're, when you're coming up on somebody you know and they're sick and, and they're suffering and they're hurting, who are they going to call on to help them, to pray for them? They're going to call on somebody who knows how to get in touch with God. Amen? Maybe, maybe they're not coming to you. Maybe, I don't know. Well, maybe they're not coming to you because well, I was going to be quiet right there. <laughs> See, they, they, there's a reason that the disciples did what they did. They came to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And Jesus said, okay, I'm going to teach you. I'm going to give you these pointers. And He goes down through this and He says, you pray like this. You pray in this pattern. Not ritualistic anymore. Not ritualistic. You pray in this pattern. And he say, he goes on to say in verse 11, Give us today our daily bread. Does that sound like Jesus is saying, Pray to the Lord to give you a new Lamborghini? Pray to the Lord to give you a big house? Pray to the Lord that, 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 we, that, that, that you have extravagant food in your... In, 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 is, that, is, that what's, is that what it sounds like? Give us today our daily bread. Give us today what we need, not what we want. Every now and then, you know, we, we get blessed with some things that the Lord 
you know, that, that some of our wants. But a lot of times what we do is we, we go out there and we make what we want happen. <laughs> I've seen it before. I know somebody who, uh, who about a year ago, he was praising the Lord because of this new truck that he got. And God worked all of it. The payment's right now. It's like, well, if God really gave it to you, wouldn't He just give it to you free and clear? But anyway. A lot of times we make things happen that we don't need to... That, that, and, and I mentioned that truck because he ended up, not too long ago, running a red light, total on his truck. He got T-boned because he ran a red light. I think I'm just going to be quiet there. But you see what I'm saying? Sometimes we make things happen that really are not what God wants us to do, or, or what, not really what we need it's what we want, right? Everybody understand the difference? Because it's like, it's like Israel saying, "Give us a king." Exactly. So we can be like other. Exactly. They wanted to be like the people around them. They wanted to be like the, all the other people had kings. They didn't understand why they, why Moses was the one that led them, and, and they didn't understand why they had to be subject to God. They didn't want that anymore. They didn't want that. They wanted to have a king like everybody else. They wanted to fit in. Right? They wanted to fit in. And so they so God and so God said, Fine, you can have your king. Here you go. And Samuel was very distraught. Boy, he was distraught. And God looked at Samuel and said, I'm going to give you what you want. Was that a good thing that they got what they wanted? Yeah. Yeah. Saul ended up leading them down very dark paths. Saul ended up eventually having the presence of God removed from him because he disobeyed. And Samuel told him disobedience is a form of witchcraft. And so, so that's why I say, you know, when we go into God's presence, we've got to go into His presence the right way. We've got, we've got to leave our pride. We've got to leave our ego. We've got to leave our, we've got to leave all of our, all of our plans. All of, we've got to leave that at the door when we come into His presence, because you know, with this our daily bread, we need to be praying to the Lord to meet our what needs, not our wants. We need to pray to the Lord, especially now. How many have been struggling with the grocery store to find stuff you need? Huh? We have. I've been to Walmart and I'm just like, I've never seen Walmart shelves this empty. We need to be praying to the Lord, supply our needs. And you know what? He will do just that. Sometimes, as my dad was growing up, and if you don't know, my dad does not, cannot stand, even though Fran Sister Francis makes the best chicken and dumplings in the world, you will never see chicken and dumplings on my dad's plate, ever. I joke with him about Cracker Barrel. Anytime they go to Cracker Barrel, like, you go going to get the chicken and dumplings? Nope. He gets beans and greens instead. Ew. But you will never see chicken and dumplings on his plate. Why? Because they didn't have a lot of money as he was growing up. So my grandmother would make the cheapest thing she could. And most of the time, it was what, Dad? Chicken and dumplings? He would have chicken and dumplings, and that's why he doesn't like them. Just like with me and ramen noodles. I'm, mm -mm, nope. My kids love those things. I'm like, you can have those nasty things all you want. I'm not eating. It's still food, though, right? If we put down and you put it down in front of all of us, even though we can't stand it, if it, if we were out of food, we're going to eat it, aren't we? If you're hungry, you're going to eat. That's our Lord's our motto around our house. If you're hungry, you're going to eat. Well, well, look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter four, verse eleven through thirteen. He says, "I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any in all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well fed or." Hungry. Hungry, whether in abundance of need or, or in need, I am able to do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We like to take that ten finger prayer and just say it, right? You do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But you go back to the verses before that and see what Paul is saying. Oh, I can make it with little or I can make it with a lot. 
Paul lived this life of submission. Paul lived it. That was his life. The life of submission. That was his life. The life of submission. And we can see what he says here. I've learned how to live, how to, how to make it with very little. I've learned how to make it with a lot. But it's in Him that I look to. It's in Him that I turn to. Do we do that in our lives? See, we need to be saying, Lord, teach us to depend on You for our needs. Not my strength. Not my job. Not my not the government, not not my not my retirement plan, not my not my Medicaid, my my Medicare, my whatever other care stuff you got out there. No, no. we need to depend on him because this money in this world will fail, and I, I dare say it's gonna it's gonna, that's gonna happen sooner than you think. So I just say that. I mean, we need to depend on Him for everything that we have. Jesus then goes on in this prayer and He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now this one's hard. This one's hard. We talked about this not long ago. This is hard. Because Jesus says that, but then He also goes down in verse 14 and says, if you don't forgive, the Father's not going to forgive you. Now that's my paraphrase. If you don't forgive, the Father won't forgive you. So he mentions this forgiveness twice. Because he knows how we are. He knows how we like to hold grudges. He knows how we are. He knows how we like to hold on to stuff. Forgive, but don't forget, right? <laughs> Maybe forgive, but I'm certainly not going to forget. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Fool me three times. What do you do then? See, Jesus is saying we have to forgive. But first of all, we've got to ask Him. This is every time we come into His presence. Every time we come into His presence, we should be saying, Lord, I need You to forgive me. I need you to cleanse me. I need you to look inside of my life. If there's anything there that's not there, that, there, that that's not of you, if there's anything that offends you, if there's anything that's in my life that's making me dirty and, and causing me to have to have to have this, this separation from you, to put this barrier up, then I need you to forgive me. I need you to show it to me, and I need you to forgive me. How often do you do that in your prayer life? Every time, because I'm afraid to hear my prayers if I don't. Okay. I think he said every time. Because God is not, you know, and I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it. God is not obligated to answer your prayers if there is sin in your life, if there's rebellion, if there's if there's unforgiveness in your life. He's not obligated to hear your prayers. Why? Because God is not obligated to bless you past your last act of disobedience. If you're not forgiving people, you're not forgiven. And, and, and that's, that's disobedience. If you've got plain out sin, that's disobedience. If you've got pride in your life, well, we know what that is. That's disobedience. See what I'm saying? You, we, every time we come into God's presence, we need to be asking Him to forgive us. You can't go any further until you do that first. You've got to ask Him to forgive you. Look at what, look at what David said. In Psalm, it, that's, that's wrong at the end. I forgot to change that. It is Psalm 139, 23 and 24. This is what David said. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me in the everlasting way. How many would say David knew how to worship? David knew how to get into God's presence. Should we not pay attention to what David said there? Should we not do that today? Should we not do that every time we come into God's presence? Search me. You know every wicked way in me. You know all the you know all the things that are there that I don't know about. You know all the things that that, that, that I've said, that I've done, that I've thought. You know my actions. You know everything. As we talked about Wednesday, God knows. 
himself for food. So should we not ask Him to expose those things that are offensive to Him? So we have to do that before we move on. We have to do that before we go any further. So that's the first thing you need to do. When you get to this point, the first thing you need to do is ask Him to reveal things to you. Ask the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit as we're learning about in Acts. And I'm looking forward to tonight. It's going to be exciting. You better, you gotta be there tonight, six o'clock. It's gonna be fun. It's gonna be exciting. We're, 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 we're getting, oh man, I'm, I'm excited. I'm already excited. Woo! Uh, but anyway, but we need to ask the Holy Spirit and allow Him in our lives. Do you allow the Holy Spirit in your life? Allow the Holy Spirit into your life and ask Him to reveal anything that's offensive to God. The second thing you do is you agree with God about what is revealed. I don't like to do this one. God reveals, oh, you said some words to that person over there yesterday and you shouldn't have said those things. What? But God, He had it coming. He deserved it. And He still says, nope, you shouldn't have said it. But God, what, how many argue with God when He reveals things? The only one that hates it. <laughs> Man, I'm, this sermon is just for me. This, is, this message is just for me today. See, this is what we do. We argue with God. We, we, we barter with Him. We, we say, no, come on. It's not that. No, if God reveals something to you, you need to say, yes, Lord. It's part of that submission thing. Yes, Lord. Yes. You did see. I saw where you went there. Yes, Lord. I did go there. Those thought, those those mean, hateful things about how you wish, how you wish to harm on somebody. I heard that too. Oh, yes, Lord. In traffic. Somebody cut you off, and you flipped up a, a hand gesture to them. I saw that too. Yes, Lord. Sometimes it's asking. I, I understand that. Can you help me with that? Yeah. And, and he does, and, and he'll he'll help us. But the thing is, we've got to agree with what he says. He reveals it. You say, "Okay, yes, I, I agree, Lord. Please help me." You know, my dog got out yesterday, and I kind of lost my crap for a while. Just run. I had a cat in hand. I had dogs barking at the door. I opened the door so they go outside and bark, and out she went. And she knows the holes, and she knew exactly where to go. And boom, she was gone in a heartbeat. I lost my I lost my junk for a while. I'm gonna be honest. I had to go and I had to go to my wife and say I'm sorry. I was mad at myself. I and I had to go to God and He's like, you shouldn't have done that. And that's the thing when you have an open an open conversation with Him, He'll reveal those things to you when they happen. All right, Lord, I'm sorry. I do. I did. I lost it. It happens. Come on, man, t t tell me it happened. Somebody out there, please tell me it happens to you too. <laughs> I can't just be me. So we, we agree with what God said, and then the next thing to do is ask God to forgive you of that particular sin and do like Nikki said, ask Him to help you overcome that, and He'll help you. And then the last thing is accept the fact that God completely forgave you and cleansed you from what it was that you did. Just believe it, accept it, and move on. Don't beat yourself up for God is not the God of condemnation. He's not going to beat you up. Anything that happened in the past, if anybody brings that up, if you place that under the blood of Jesus, you know who that's coming from? It's not coming from God. Who's it coming from? Satan. Because he is the accuser of the brethren. Amen? Amen. That's what he does. That's his job. See, in Colossians 3, in Colossians, oh, praise the Lord. I'll keep, no, 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 let's see, is it here? 
Nope, yeah, there it is. Colossians 3.13, it says, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a grievance against another, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also are to forgive. Well, what are we talking about here? Well, look at what he says. Forgive us our debts. Okay, we just talked about that. As we also have forgiven our debtors. Okay, how many expect God to forgive you? If you ask for His forgiveness... How many expect God to forgive you? We all do. Because God is a faithful God. And if we come before Him, John tells us in 1 John, that if we come before Him, that He is faithful and we confess it, He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Okay? So, notice how Jesus says it though. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, as we forgive those who have sinned against us, please forgive me, Lord. This is where we don't. We, just, we don't. <laughs> this is like, whoa! No, I'm off the train now. How many expect God to forgive you when you ask Him? Everybody in here needs to raise your hand. We all expect it. How many have forgiven those that have sinned against us? Because if we expect God, thank you. If we expect God to forgive us, we have to forgive others. Sometimes that requires asking God to help us do that because it's hard not human nature. It is. I struggle with it too. There are those that I know that have hurt me, hurt my family, hurt those close to me, and it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. I've got to learn to forgive them. And as she said, we've uh, in, in those cases, you know, that, that forgiveness is slow sometimes because some of the things are heinous that they do to people, right? Okay, what's your question? Does that have to be in person? That's why I don't understand. Okay. It can be any way that you're, but it can be, it can be any way. It, it can be any, you, can, you can release them and say, "I forgive you," even though you did this. You know, you can do it through letter, even email. You know, just uh, whatever, whatever you feel there. I mean, if you can't see them physically, you can't see them personally. But see, this is the thing, and I appreciate that question because that's you know that that is hard because you know you're like, okay, the Lord speaks to me. I you know the person lives in in, in Ohio. I I can't get up there. You know. <laughs> Phone call, letter, email, text message, whatever. But the thing is, you have to learn how to forgive even if they never say, I'm sorry. You have to. You have to release them. What did Jesus do as He was hanging on the cross? Think about Jesus on the cross. He's on the cross. He's on the... Hold on. He's on the cross. He's hanging there. You see blood running down off of him everywhere. Crown of thorns. Beaten, his face beaten where you can't even recognize who he is. He's, he's stabbed. I mean, think about it. And Chris, what did he say? Did any of them ask... Okay, she said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Okay? Did any of them ask for his forgiveness? The Roman soldiers, they were just there doing a job. They didn't see anything wrong with what they were doing. That was their job. Just like, you know, just like going into a factory. This was their job. That was what they did. And so, Jesus hanging on the cross says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. None of them asked for forgiveness. And yet Jesus said, forgive them. So we have to learn how to forgive even if we don't hear the words, I'm sorry, come out of anybody's mouth. We have to learn how to forgive. Piper, you had your hand up. Again... <laughs> That is, and that, and that's a, that's a difficult thing 
you know, you, at some point in time, just like what Sister what Sister Terry said, at some point in time, you do need to you need to reach out, whether they say I'm sorry or not. You know, it, it's it could be one of those things. I forgive you, but I can't have you close to me until things are made right. I forgive you, but I can't have you in my life. I like you've heard the term "love them from a distance." That's what you have to do. Because it's better for you. Because if, they, if, if you're not going to get that apology that you're deserved. If you're not, and I know what she's talking about. If, you, if you're not going to get that apology you're deserved, you forgive them. But every time you come in there and you see them, it's going to just be like a band-aid. You know? And sometimes it's better just to you know, see what I'm going to love you from a distance. I forgive you, but i got to keep you at arm's length. You understand what I'm saying? What? Right. It comes a festering wound that never heals. So, and trust me, I knew it was going to be hard when we got to this because it's hard. Forgiving people is hard. But if we expect God to forgive us, we have to learn how to forgive others. We have to. It's not a choice. And so we see what Paul said there. And, 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 and that means in here, out there, everywhere, we've got to learn how to make allowances for one another because we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? If you're perfect, raise your hand. Yeah, okay, no, you're not. <laughs> See, in, in, in forgiving others, this is the this is kind of the this is kind of the plan. In forgiving others, we must admit that someone has offended us. You have to admit it. You've got to admit it to yourself. You've got to admit it maybe to them. Say, listen, you hurt my feelings. We Nick Nikki actually had this had this with, 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 with someone here recently. I'm not going to get too much into it, but she looked at that person and said, Listen, you offended me. You hurt me. Now that person skated over it and didn't even didn't even address what she was talking about. Just skated right over it. But I mean, this is what we got to do. We've got to admit that we're hurt. We've got to admit it to ourselves, to others, to God. And we've got to that's the first step. The second thing we do is then we release them. We release their debt. We release the fact that they hurt us. And it's hard. It's hard. You know, Jesus again did this on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. I don't know what they're doing. And and then the, the, the third thing, the last thing in this step is that we ask God for the grace to seek reconciliation with that person. Again, sometimes it's better just to love people from a distance. Forgive them. Don't have any hatred in your heart, don't have any bitterness. But sometimes you just can't have people in your life. Right? Like, I've, I've got one person in mind I can think of that I just cannot have in my life. It's toxic. I can't have that person, but I have to forgive them. It's the way it goes. That's what Jesus wants us to do. He expects us to do. And so we need to learn. We, we need to say, Lord, teach us to forgive and to be forgiven. Teach us to forgive and to be forgiven. And we have to remember too that help us with that step number two is that people that live in this world, we can't expect them mm -hmm. to live by God's laws. And we can't expect them to have the heart of Christ. You know, we have to offer the grace that we expect God to give us. And if we, you know, those other fellow Christians, if we remember how many times we go back to God mm -hmm. and how many times we mess up, we have to offer that same grace to others because Right. So that's where we need to say, Lord, when we're praying to Him, teach me how to pray, and or teach me how to forgive, and teach me how to be forgiven. Because a lot of times, let's be honest, we don't forgive ourselves, do we? Spirit of condemnation comes and beats us up. We're not forgetting ourselves. We're allowing the enemy to come in and use that condemnation. And the last part of this prayer that we're talking about this morning, it says, and do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God's not going to tempt you. Okay? God's not going to tempt you. That's not what God does. God doesn't, He doesn't lead you into evil. Okay? Now, He does allow us to be tested. He does allow us to be tempted. Right? You look at Job. Job's the, Job is the prime example of this. 
Satan went into God's presence twice. First time he said, Job's only he's only he's only living for you because you got your hand on him. Take your hand off and let me do whatever I want. God said, Okay, you can you can do that, but you can't take his life. Job lost everything. He still didn't curse God. Satan goes back in and says, You're only doing that, and he's only doing this to you because you still got your hand on him. You're still protecting him. Let me have him. And, and God said, fine. You can do whatever you want to do to his body. You still can't kill him. Job, how many can say Job was tempted? Even by his wife. She looked at him. I would have kicked her to the curb. Brother Betty knows what I'm talking about. I keep her there. She looked at him. She looked at Job and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Look at you. Look at what you're doing with your boils. And go, look at you. Why don't you just curse God and die? I don't need you in my life. Get out of here. Job was tempted numerous times by his friends. I don't know if you call them friends. By his wife. <laughs> He was tempted, but he still never cursed God. Eventually, he ended up seeing himself in the eyes of God. He ended up seeing, and when God, when God looks down at you and says, Where were you when I created the world? Where were you when I laid the foundations? Where were you at when I created? Where were you? That's when you just you humble yourself. This Job didn't just lay down and say, Um, um, yes, uh, yes. See, so, somebody, okay, so, uh, so, so we see that, that the Lord's not going to lead, lead us into temptation, but sometimes He will allow us to be tempted. And that's where we need to pray this part of the prayer and say, don't bring me, in, protect me from the temptations. Make sure that I'm doing what I need to do so, so I can stay away from it. See, Paul says, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, No temptation has come upon you except what is common to humanity. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way out so that you may be able to bear it. What is our way out of every temptation? Starts with a J, ends with an Jesus. Jesus is our way out of every temptation. I mean, he's he's going to get us. He's the the way is there. See, the thing is, a lot of times what we like to do is we like to toe the line, don't we? We like to toe that line. See how close to the world we can get without sinning, right? We like to toe that line. We like to get right there. Well, I'll just I'll just get close. Well, I'll just go have lunch with these people. Well, I'll just I, 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 it's only a phone call, right? It's only a phone call. Why I'm only communicating by Snapchat. Those those things disappear anyway, so I can share whatever I want, right? Huh? I don't know. But anyway. See, this is what we do though. We like to tow that line. We like to get as close to the world as possible. And we set ourselves up for failure. We set ourselves up for failure. We were we had some, some sayings going around on Friday and 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 it, it, basically, if you don't make the plan, and you, you can't work the plan, you, if you plan your life out and you plan to stay away from stuff, guess what? You're gonna stay away from stuff. There are there are gonna be things, potholes, and things that pop up, and that's where you say, Lord, just help me, just help me. But you, you but but when you, I mean, you, Paul tells tells Timothy, when you see it, run from it. When you see it coming. Turn the other way. Go the other way. Run. Don't place yourself in a situation where you're going to fail. Get away from it. Do you see how we? I mean, this is what we do. We try, but we don't do that. We we get as close to it as we can. We cuddle up to it, and then we're like, God, why did I fail? Why did you lead me into this place where I failed? Right? God gets the blame. Two people get the blame the most. God. And the devil. The devil made me do it. Anybody remember Flip Wilson? Anybody ever heard that saying? The devil made me do it? 
Devil doesn't make you do anything. He places it there. He says, there you go. Makes it look all nice and shiny and pretty and, 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 and makes, you, makes you want after it. It's your choice that gets you there. The devil doesn't make you do anything. God doesn't make you chase after Him. You've got to want one or the other. And that's what happens. But you don't. If you want to stay away from temptation, you don't want to fall, then what you need to do is when you see it coming, run. Run the other way. See, there is something that we must understand about being led by God. There's something we've got to understand. The Holy Spirit is for our benefit. He comforts us. He guides us. He keeps us out of trouble. He keeps a, as Paul says, the way is always been, is always provided when we're being tempted. And we need to be saying, Lord, teach me to trust your leading. I don't want to go there, but if you say to go there, I'll go there. Going to the projects, I don't want to go there, God, but if that's where you're going to be, I want to go there. See, there's something about submitting to God. There's something about submitting to God. Now, am I, am I here and I'm, and, 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 and am I doing, Gene, come on, get ready, Ricardo, come on, get ready, come on, come back up. Am, 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 I, am, am I judging anybody? Am I saying you're doing it wrong? Am I saying, am I saying, no, I'm not saying any of that. I'm not. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not here, I'm not here casting that condemnation. That's not why, that's not why we're doing this. That's not, that's not why we're going through this. We need to learn what to do when we come into God's presence. And you admit, maybe you realize today I, I, I'm doing it wrong. Or, or, or man, I, I don't ask God to forgive me. Or, or man, I, I don't submit to Him. Or I have this pride thing that in my life when I'm coming to God's presence, uh, that this, the, the best way to fix it, the best way to learn how to pray, anybody want to take a guess at what it is? Pray. The best way to learn how to pray is to pray. And how... No, I'm not going to say coincidental. How wonderful is it that this week we start prayer on Tuesday afternoons from 5.30 to 7, or as long as you want to stay. This Tuesday we are beginning our prayer back up again. It's been a while. We are beginning prayer this Tuesday. And I encourage everyone here to come and be part of that anywhere from 5.30 to 7. We'll be here. Somebody will be in the building. Somebody will be here. We will have some music playing. We'll have worship, uh, just, uh, just a worshipful attitude, uh, atmosphere. Today is the day. Or this week is the week we're starting prayer back up. So I encourage you, come out from 5.30 to 7. Join us in prayer as we pray for our nation, as we pray for our city, as we pray for our state, as we pray for the state of this world, and as we pray for each other. Can I get an amen there? Amen. We are praying again. If you don't feel well, please stay home. It's kind of the same thing we have with church. If you don't feel well, please stay home. But the best way to learn how to pray is to pray. So I encourage you, as they lead us in praise and worship, and we, I know we, we're, we're doing it at the end, at the back end, and, and, and let, let, let's go ahead and start with your first song. Get, get that ready to go, man. And, and, and as, as, we, as, as you do this, as we worship, the, 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 the altars are open for you to come and spend some time practicing what we've learned today and to put this into practice. For this week, I encourage you to set aside five or ten minutes to work on this, to, get, to have that prayer right out there in front of you and to go through there and, and to try this method that Jesus left us with. So, so I encourage you to do that. Don't just simply repeat it, but look through it and remember, okay, I need to acknowledge God, okay? I, I need to ask Him to forgive me. I, I, I need to ask Him to, fulfill, to, to meet my daily needs, okay? So the altars are open as they lead us in praise and worship. If you, if you feel the tug of God, please come forward. Please come forward and let's spend some time with Him. Now go ahead, brother. Go ahead, brother and sister. Do it.